Thanks, Ben, so much for the wonderful introduction and for having me here and for the invitation. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who's involved in Creative Mornings uh, for making such wonderful and important events possible. And of course, thank you all for coming today, this Friday morning. My topic today is boredom. And more specifically, I'm interested in investigating the role that boredom plays in our everyday life and also examining whether uh, boredom can be beneficial to us. So my topic is boredom. My aim is not to bore you. So <laughs> I'm going to start by telling you three stories. And I believe going through each story, there is something to learn, something important about boredom. So the first story is about the art of boredom. So sometime, I believe it's either between January and June 1893, Eric Satie, a very famous French composer and pianist, wrote a piece called Vexations. Um, is anyone familiar with Vexations here? Has anyone heard it? OK, well, um, you can Spotify it later. Um, it's a short piece. Um, it's composed, consists of a bass theme of 18 notes, followed by two harmoni harmoni harmonizations. Um, if, you, if you listen to the piece, it, it's a little bit skewed, eccentric, but somehow pleasant at the same time. Um, what's fascinating about vexations isn't that much its musical composition. It's the fact that if you look at the very top of the musical sheet over there, you find an enigmatic or cryptic inscription. So Sadi wrote the following. In order to play the theme 840 times in succession, it would be advisable to prepare oneself beforehand and in the deepest silence by serious immobilities. Now, it's not clear what he meant by this, and there's a lot of disagreement. Um, as it turns out, fast forward 50 or 60 years, 1949, John Cage, gets a copy of Vexations. And he becomes intrigued by the very possibility of staging a complete performance of Vexations. And indeed, September 9th, 1963, he gets a group of uh, other 11 pianists, each taking terms, 20 minute terms, and they perform the entire piece. Um, it takes them 18 hours and 40 minutes to complete vexations. Throughout the performance, the audience waxed and waned. Um, reportedly, the art critic for the New York Times fell asleep at 4 a.m. But one person sat through the entire performance. And you know, he must have liked it. But then how could he? Right? 18 hours and 40 minutes. 840 repetitions of the same piece. Doesn't that get boring? Shouldn't it be boring? So John Cage, we thought a lot about boredom, time, and repetition, has the following to say about um, the role of boredom. He says, if so look, if something is boring after two minutes, try it for four. If it's still boring, try for eight, 16, 32, and so on. Eventually, one discovers that it's not boring at all, but very interesting. So here's the connection between time, boredom, and being interesting. Um, someone else who thought a lot about vexations, Dick Higgins, right, writes about the experience of vexations. So the question is, of course, is it boring to sit through the entire performance? Well, he says, look, only at first. After a while, the euphoria begins to intensify. By the time the piece is over, the silence is absolutely numbing. So much of an environment has the peace become. When you read such claims about vexations and boredom, you know, what comes to my mind is that, well, boredom seems to be very peculiar 
It's a weird thing. It's a weird sensation, a weird emotion. And I'm calling this that boredom is protein. It takes different forms and shapes. I, um, to each its own. What I find boring <coughs> might not be what you find boring. So my boredom is not necessarily your boredom. And it's probably not the boredom of, uh, of John Cage or the person who sat through the entire performance of vexations. Often, boredom turns out to be situational. It has to do with the situation in which we find ourselves. Right? So if you're boring, um, sitting through the performance of vexations, well, there's an easy solution. Just walk outside. Right? And boredom might immediately disappear. My favorite quote on boredom comes from Pessoa. He says, everything except boredom bores me. Everything can bore one. That's a weird claim. Right? What does that mean? What does that tell us about boredom? So the first question I want to raise after the first story is this. Can boredom tell us anything? Right? If we all have our own boredoms, right, to use plural here, um, is there anything that boredom can teach us? Well, I wouldn't be here if I thought otherwise, but I need to continue with my story. So I'll get back to this question. So story number two, the myth of boredom. So, this is a much older story. Um, in different forms, it has been told by Aeschylus, Herodotus, Ovid. I heard it from relatives and friends, and it even figures in popular culture. Uh, it begins very, very predictably. You have a beautiful girl named Io. Um, she resided in Argos, ancient Greece, where she was the priestess of the goddess Hera, and Hera was the wife of Zeus. Zeus couldn't resist her beauty, so he had to seduce her. Hera got very suspicious, and Zeus, in, a, in an attempt to conceal his own transgression, he transformed Io into a beautiful white cow. So Hera was not fooled by this, so she demanded Io as a gift. Zeus obliged, but Hera had no use for the cow, so she put it under the guard of a watchman called Argus. Um, apparently, he had eyes all over his body, and he never slept, so he was good for this role. Um, <laughs> Zeus was not happy by this outcome. He sent Hermes to steal Io, and according to the myth, uh, Hermes lured, lured him to sleep, but I think he actually bored him to sleep, and then he was able to cut his head off. So Io was free, and Hera was pissed, and so she set down a gadfly to pester Io. You might have heard about the, the role of gadfly in ancient mythology, and here's an instance of it. So what happens? Right? You have something really small, like a gadfly, that can pester, in this case, keeps pestering Io. Io can find no rest whatsoever. She has to travel from place to place, eventually finding it, her way to Egypt. Right. So the point of the story is something analogous applies to boredom. And if you look into the history of thinking about boredom, you get this idea that boredom begins to look like a gadfly. And that means, can mean two things. One, it means, just like a gadfly, boredom is rather trivial. Right? We all experience it, but most of us don't really care that much, or we just try to find ways to do away with it. Right? It's often very fleeting. It comes, and then it goes. Right? We can allay it easily, right? do something else, check your phone. Um, it's banal. Sometimes it's not that, you know what? I don't, you know, I, I find it extremely interesting, so I don't accept that it's banal in this case. But it's not like a conversation. I don't, imagine a conversation, I'm so bored, and then what else are you going to say? What are you doing? I'm watching television and doing this. It's not that. It doesn't have that much richness in it, one might think. Um, also, one might think it's inconsequential. It doesn't matter that much if, you have, if you're bored or not. Just get rid of it. So this fits well with this idea of a gadfly as something that pesters you. Something small, hopefully you can just do away with it quickly and go about, do your everyday job. Right? The other idea that it's related to gutfly, and you can see that in the very myth, 
Remember that the gadfly drove E all the way to Egypt. Is that boredom actually is not that trivial. It's very serious. And that has to do, when I, use the, when I say boredom is serious, I mean boredom as a kind of an existential condition. Imagine finding yourself bored all the time. That would be something serious, something that you need to consider. Um, so we can say that taking that idea of boredom as a gadfly, as a serious gadfly, it can be toxic, destructive. It's related to a number of bodily, psychological, and social harms. And as Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard once said, boredom is the root of all evil. And in fact, there is a lot of psychology linking this propensity to experience boredom to a number of bad things. Aggression, depression, gambling, drinking, a lot of other social and psychological problems. So here's the story. If you look into the literature of boredom, you get two sides of boredom. You get this idea that boredom is either trivial or serious. But if it's trivial, right, it doesn't really matter. Right? It's not worth of our attention. It's inconsequential. But if it's serious, then the only reason why we need to spend time considering boredom is just to avoid it, is to make sure that we're not going to get into trouble. Right? So here's the question that I want to raise. Is there another side? Does something lie hidden? Does this twofold conception of boredom hide something important about boredom? I think it does. So I'm going to get to it with the third story. So story number three, this has to do with the function of boredom. So often absences have this remarkable capacity of making things present, of illuminating things. Just think of a silent pause. Think how we can demarcate transitions. But also think of negative space. If you like design, negative space is a cool device to use. You can make, you can make shapes pop out. You can make things present by using negative space. I think something similar can be said about emotions and affective states. So what I want to say, if we consider the absence of emotions, the absence of emotions can tell us something about emotions that is hard to tell when we are being bombarded with all our emotions, when we're in the midst of having a bunch of emotions at the same time. So here's what I want you to consider. I want you to consider, briefly, a life that lacks the capacity to experience pain. Right? Just think of what it will be like for you to go about your everyday life, but you will never experience pain. So you might accidentally touch a hot stove, but that's not going to hurt. You're going to be harmed, but it's not going to hurt you. Um, so having you consider, asking you to consider that, it's, I'm not asking you to consider a fiction. And if you look into the medical literature, you'll find a bunch of cases, a good number of them, of people suffering from what's known as congenital insensitivity to pain, an incapacity to experience pain. So the absence of the capacity to experience pain, I think tells us something or can tell us something important about pain. So what we know about pain, right, we know that it's not that great. Right? It's unpleasant. Right? What we can learn from looking into the absence of pain is that the capacity to feel pain is actually good for us. Right? And those two claims might sound paradoxical or contradictory, but one has to do with the actual sensation, the other has to do with the capacity. So if you look into the lives of subjects who suffer from an incapacity to experience pain, what you find out is that their lives are pretty hard. Right? Just imagine all the harm that will be done to themselves and it would be unnoticed. It will go unnoticed. <coughs> they live short and hard lives. Right? And why is that? Because we know that pain is a good thing to have. The capacity to experience pain is good. It's a reliable mechanism right? that first tells us about the presence of harm. Right? Oops, something's going on with your body, something not very good. Right? But it also does something else. It motivates us to protect our bodies. It motivates us to change our behavior, to make sure that we're not being harmed all the time. Right? Okay, so that's what the absence of pain can tell us. Can we learn something from the absence of boredom? 
So now consider a life um, during which nothing strikes you as boring. Right? It might sound like an ideal life. Right? I'm not sure about that. Because what I, when I ask you to imagine a boring free life, a, bo a, uh, a life that is um, free of boredom, that doesn't mean that it is a life that has no uninteresting situations. It's not that you're going to experience a life that everything is exciting. In the same way that if you lack the capacity to experience pain, some of the stimuli that you're going to encounter are indeed harmful, even if you don't register them as painful. So the same will happen in the case of the lack of boredom. Nothing will be perceived as boring, even if a lot of things are uninteresting to you. Right? But it seems that certain things should be experienced as boring. I mean, imagine waiting at the airport for 20 hours. That's pretty boring. You shouldn't be excited by that. I mean, unless, I don't know, unless if you're doing some weird art, like a performance piece at the airport, I don't know, something like that. But 20 hours is a long time. Or imagine watching endless reruns of Seinfeld. At some point, it should get boring. Right. So what, what can we learn from this? Well, I think we can learn a few things. So staying with this idea of no boredom, Boredom-free life. What are the problems with that? Well, here's the first problem. We run the risk of being stuck in uninteresting situations. And why do we run this risk? Well, simply because we don't, cannot tell what's interesting or not. Right? Boring, boredom tells us, oh, this is not, this is not interesting. Right? It's, the, it's a way that our self informs us of something that's not interesting. At the same time, we run the risk of living a, a life that it's not truly our own. What does that mean? I mean, think, think about how we go, how we author our lives. What does it mean to author your life? Well, it means that you make up your own projects, you find difficulties in life, you overcome some of them, but you also decide that these are projects worth pursuing because they're interesting, because they're meaningful to me, and these are projects that, eh, I don't care that much about. They don't speak to me, they don't grasp me. But if you live a life during which or in which everything is interesting, then you don't have that demarcation. Right? So boredom is one of those sensations or emotions that really allows us to demarcate our lives, to draw lines and decide this is me and this is not me. At the same time, relating to the first and two um, points and relating to our theme of time, you're going to waste a lot of time if you like boredom. You want to have this quick, effective mechanism that's going to tell you, boring, move on. All right, boring, do something else. You will really have to think about, it. is this boring? Is Seinfeld boring at this point? All right. So drawing the analogy with pain, I want to say that the capacity to experience boredom is good for us, even though it's not pleasant being bored. All right. It's not that I'm telling you, go become bored. Right. Try to experience as much boredom as possible. That's not the message. The message is that, look, it's, we have reasons to think that the, the, this capacity to experience boredom does work for us. We're lucky to have it. In fact, I think it's, we're, we're better off having it than lacking it. Right? And wh why is that claim? Because I think boredom serves a function, and this is what I want to um, discuss a little bit in, in, a, in a bit more detail. What is the function of boredom? What exactly is the role of boredom? To talk about it, it will help to divide the state of boredom, of the experience of boredom, in three components. And I'm calling them the affective, the volitional, and cognitive component. And here, I will need your help mentally. So as I'm talking about boredom, try to remember what it is like to experience boredom. Right? Um, so if you, if you remember the sensation of boredom, right, how it feels to be bored, then I'm talking about the affective element of boredom. It's unpleasant. It's not, it's not good. We don't want to be bored. Let's think about the volitional element of work. That has to do with the kinds of desires that we have when we're bored. I mean, I think the primary desire that we have when we're bored is to do something else. Often anything but what we're currently doing. Right? We just want to, I want to do something else. 
And what about the cognitive element? I mean, again, think about, think about things that you find interesting uh, and think then compare them to boring things. Boring things cannot grasp your attention. Uh, it's, it's very hard for you to focus on something that is boring. So the cognitive element in boredom is that it just doesn't keep us engaged. We have lost your, our engagement with the situation that we find to be boring. And at the same time, what do we do? We often mind wonder. Right? We think about, oh, I want to be doing something else like this. Right? And, or I'm making a catalog. I'm, in my mind, I'm making a list of all the other wonderful things that I could be doing. Anything but what I'm doing right now. Right? So consider what it is to experience boredom. It's not nice. You don't like it being bored. It pushes you, has this desire to do something else. And also, it makes salient other things that you want to be doing. So I think that if you put those three together, the elements together, what boredom does, it regulates our behavior in a weird way. So when you find yourself in an uninteresting situation, something that is not meaningful to you, boredom kicks in. That is like an alarm. It pushes you to do something else. It tries to put you in line with what you actually want to be doing. So in that way, boredom acts as a state that can regulate our behavior. So let me note a couple of things about boredom here that I think are really important, and they summarize this idea of the function of boredom. First, let's think again back to our experience of boredom. Right? Think of something that you find to be boring. Maybe waiting, uh, waiting for a doctor's appointment that's taking forever. Right? Um, what is there? What's present there? One thing that seems to be necessary to experience boredom is that there's a mismatch. There's a mismatch between what we want and what is given to us. Right? I want to be done with the appointment. I want to do something else. Right? But what is given to me is not that. Or consider another example. Consider when you're bored with repetitive activity or monotony. Right? What do you crave often is novelty, something new, originality glimpses of creativity, but you're not getting that. So boredom often arises when there's this mismatch between my need for excitement, my need for arousal, my need for stimulation, and what the world is giving me, what others are giving me. So what we can note is that boredom is telling us things. It's informative, both about our situation and about ourselves. So, if you find yourself in a boring situation, that means the situation just doesn't do it for you. It means that the situation doesn't offer what you want to have in that particular moment. It means that it doesn't stimulate you in the right way or to the right extent, to the right amount. Right? So if you find a lecture boring, hopefully not this one right now, um, I, it might mean because it just doesn't stimulate you at the right level. It's either too basic for you or just too advanced. Right? If you find uh, waiting at the airport boring, well, why is that boring for you? Well, it doesn't meet your purposes. It doesn't help you do what you want to be doing. Right? It doesn't give you the means to accomplish what you want to be doing. So when boredom arises, it's telling us things about the situation. It doesn't, it's not that clear in the way that I just described it. Right? It doesn't come with words. It doesn't come with sentences doesn't give you full descriptions of your situation, but it gives you this annoying feeling that something, ah, I want to be doing something else. So let's take note of that feeling. The other idea that can be found in boredom is that boredom not only tells us something about the situation, it also tells us something about ourselves. I think that's crucial. Um, so let's do a couple of examples. Imagine being bored with contemporary art. Right? You might go to a museum, you see a bunch of exhibitions on contemporary art, and you find them boring. Now, it's a good thing to ask why they're boring. Right? What does that tell you about yourself? It might tell you that you know, I've considered contemporary art, and I find it still find it boring. Or it might tell you, I don't know enough about contemporary art, and that's why I'm finding it boring. Right? Maybe I need to do a little bit more work. Maybe not. Right? But it does tell you something about what's close to you, what's meaningful to you, and what can engage with you in the right way. Another example, you might be bored with your children. I don't know if you have children, but you might, be, you might experience boredom. Um, 
There are kind of two ways you can experience boredom. So let me describe the kind of boredom that I hope you don't experience. OK, oh, I'll get back to it. Um, so the type of boredom that hopefully you don't experience is actually really being boring, bored with having children, with the very idea of being a parent. That's a bad kind of boredom. That tells you that, well, being a parent is not one of your life projects. That's bad. Preferably, let's realize this before having children. Right? <laughs> the other type of boredom that I experience, and I, <laughs> I think it's a little bit better, is being bored while playing with your children. Right? There's only so much Thomas the Train that you can do in one day. Right? There's only so much you can do. So that's not necessarily bad. What it tells you is that, well, yeah, my interests do not lie with wooden trains. I kind of knew that. Right? But I'm going to endure it because you know, my interests actually do lie with spending time with my children. Right? So it does, it's very informative. We can learn a lot from boredom. So here's the message. So here's the big message in a lot of words. Boredom promotes maintenance and restoration of the perception that one's activities are meaningful. And let me explain this idea. It just helps us to make sure that what we're doing is what we actually want to be doing and not something else. So you might find yourself in an interesting, unchallenging, non-stimulating, or tedious situations. Right? We all find ourselves in those situations. Right? What boredom does or what boredom wants to do wants to take us out of those situations and into situations that are actually in line with our overall desires, interests, and goals. Right? You wanna, you, boredom tries to do that. How? It's not pleasant, so we want to do something else. We have the desire of doing something else. And it also, the cognitive development of boredom. Right? When we're bored, we don't keep our attention to the current situation, but we think of other situations. So that's what I believe to be the function of boredom, something, the ways in which boredom can be useful to our life and the ways in which we can use boredom for our own benefit. So I think the final message, if there is a final message, is that I think it's important to take time for boredom. And that means let's not be too quick to dismiss boredom as an emotion. Let's not be too, too quick to do something else, anything, just to mask the experience of boredom. Boredom is trying to tell us certain things, and it's also trying to push us into more meaningful, interesting state. So it's important to take time for boredom so that we don't waste it. And it here, I think, um, it's meant to be ambiguous, so it refers both to boredom and time. So first, we don't want to waste boredom. I believe boredom is a resource, something that we can harness. It has a power, has an energy that's useful for us. If we pay attention to it. But at the same time, right, no one wants to waste time. So if we don't pay attention to boredom, we run the risk of finding ourselves in more boring and more boring situations. Right. Thank you very much.